Okay, we're going to get underway now, even though people are continuing to come in. I want to welcome you to tonight's lecture on, be, on behalf of History 3723, which is Tyndale College's course on the history of population, the family, and bioethics. Uh, I see a good turnout from the students in that course. I also want to welcome you on behalf of the DeWeber Institute for Bioethics, of which I'm the Vice President and Research Director. And really, it, it was the DeWeber Institute that made this lecture possible through generous support from a lot of donors. And you have some information about the DeWeber Institute on your chairs. I urge you to read it, and if you feel moved, a donation would be most welcome to the DeWeber Institute. Now, I want to introduce tonight's speaker, Alex Schadenberg. He has been the executive director of the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition since its founding 15 years ago. He's the author of Exposing Vulnerable People to Euthanasia and Assisted Suicide, which was published last year, and it's on the table here. You can come and look at it, and if you like it, buy it. Alex has spoken widely in Belgium, Scotland, New Zealand, and Switzerland, Belgium, Italy, and throughout the United States, where he has debated with several leaders of the euthanasia lobby. Since 2007, he has chaired the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition International. He has organized several international symposia on the subject of euthanasia in Canada, Australia, and the United States. In his international role, he has also published many articles in newspapers across the world. Alex also boasts the world's most widely read blog on euthanasia and assisted suicide. I can't think of anyone anywhere who knows more about this subject than Alex Schadenberg. And tonight, he's going to give us the benefit of his up-to-date knowledge on this subject as it plays out I think, I think I'm right, in the Netherlands, Belgium, Switzerland, the American states of Oregon and Washington. Yes, he's nodding. Thank goodness I'm right. And of course, Canada, where the issue is very timely indeed. <clears throat> now, the person who knows Alex perhaps better than anyone else is Barry DeWeber, the uh, Emeritus Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Western Ontario. And I just want to call on Barry to say a, a few words about Alex whom he knows much better than I do. So, Dr. DeWeber. I'm delighted to uh, say a few words about Alex, who was uh, really a phenomenon. When I first met him 15 years ago, he was kind of a, a boyish looking fellow with a theology degree who was interested in uh, in euthanasia when uh, the pro-life movement was still pretty focused on abortion and I, I just sympathized entirely with him what he wanted to do and we started in a little room in the Catholic Family Center <laughs> and then we moved many times each office getting bigger and bigger and uh, I was the president for Ontario and then I'm not sure, I think about the time it was for Canada, I think we let Alex take over, executive director. And then he was elected unanimously at an international meeting to be the international director of um, Palliative Care uh, Association. So it's been a long and hard struggle and it's really tough now with Quebec uh, having legalized this, whether we can get the Supreme Court to reverse that. We're not too sure about that. Our case in the Supreme Court didn't go too well, and so all the forces are sort of working against us, but we can't give up. It's serious. I see it in the hospitals, older people being shuffled off, over-sedated, dehydrated, and I can tell you all, if you have a loved one in the hospital, you better watch what they're doing, because they're trying to get rid of them. And I'm 85, and I I'm really worried about going into a hospital, even though I worked in them. So uh, I'm just so grateful for Alex. He's a, a brilliant guy. He could have been a multi-millionaire in business, and he's worked so hard, and he's been everywhere, and he's got a wonderful wife and, what, seven kids? Yeah. 
Seven. Six. Six? Wow. I always exaggerate a bit. <laughs> so my wife says. <laughs> anyway, here he is. A favorite son. Now I guess the theory is if you have a small room, it looks like the room is full, then it's great. But if you have a small room and the room is full, then maybe you should have had a little bit larger room. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, we're glad to be here together, and I'm going to talk about these issues. I have a lot of material, so um, the uh, the young lady who's changing my slides for me might change the slide quicker at some point. I'm, I'm going to tell her to do that because the fact of it is is that uh, we don't want to be here all night. Uh, I like you all very much, but I'm sure you don't want to be with me all night, so we're going to go through this material uh, together. And uh, I think it's quite important to first talk about de definitions to understand what we're talking about with euthanasia and assisted suicide. Uh, you're going to notice those that have the uh, blue sheet called protecting people from euthanasia and assisted suicide. You'll see that's like the cheat sheet for this information. Uh, euthanasia, so what is it? Euthanasia is both an action or a mission of an action which is done intentionally to cause death. Because a lot of people say, you know, euthanasia issues, it's a bit confusing. And I say, well, really, it's not that confusing. The point of it is, is these are acts to cause death where the death results from the action. So how is it usually done? Usually done by lethal injection. Usually done by lethal injection. It's direct and it's intentional. It is the cause of death. So when people start talking about other issues related to medical treatment questions, uh, they do not apply to euthanasia unless the intention and the action is to cause death. Euthanasia is a type of homicide. So when we're talking about euthanasia, we're talking about somebody else killing you. We're not talking about you killing yourself. Somebody else is killing you. That's defined as homicide. And it only differs from common homicide in its supposed intention of relieving suffering. Of course, the question is, who's suffering? It's often referred to as mercy killing. So we'll move on. So what is euthanasia not? It's not withholding or withdrawing medical treatment. And now remember, I've said treatment. I'm not talking about basic care. I'm not talking about ordinary care. I'm talking about treatment. If you withdraw medical treatment and someone is to die, that is not euthanasia. Okay? The proper use of large doses of pain-killing drugs. The proper use is not euthanasia, and the use of sedation is not euthanasia. Now, why do I say this? Because people argue, you hear it argued all the time, saying, well, you know, Alex, we do this all the time. We withdraw medical treatment and somebody dies. Is that not the same as euthanasia? Well, it's not euthanasia, because what happens? If you withdraw medical treatment, what happens? The person may or may not die. If you withdraw medical treatment, they often don't die. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. And if they did die, what did they die of? They died of their medical condition. No one caused their death. Euthanasia is when you directly and intentionally cause death. Okay? It is a form of homicide. Very clear. When I say it's not about the proper use of large doses of pain-killing drugs, we hear it heard. Well, Alex, we do this all the time. They give people a large dose of morphine and the person dies. So I say, well, wait a second. And they say, isn't that the same as euthanasia? And I say, well, wait a second here. Is it euthanasia then to intend to relieve pain? And the answer is, of course not. It's not euthanasia to intend to relieve pain. Now there is a reality. We all acknowledge the reality that there are some people who might not be ethical and who might abuse the use of pain-killing drugs, who might intentionally give somebody a massive dose of morphine, for instance, in order to cause their death, meaning the intention was to cause their death and that's why they did it. That would obviously be different, but we don't want to in any way discourage the use of pain-killing uh, medications, palliative care. We don't want to discourage that in any way. We just recognize, of course, that there's a responsibility there in the proper use. And of course, sedation is a whole other question, because some people say, well, isn't, you know, we, you know, we sedate people. Someone who would be in pain, uh, if they're in intractable pain, we sedate them, and is that not the same as euthanasia? Well, of course it's not euthanasia, because, of course, sedation can be temporary. So, you know, if you give me a lethal dose, what happens to me? I'm dead. I'm gone. I'm dead. Can't come back. If you sedate me, you can take me out of sedation. Obviously, they're not the same. And even further to this, you know, 
and I tell this story, it's truthful. I was speaking in Scotland with, uh, and there was a friend of mine who was actually from Australia. We were both speaking at a conference in Scotland. It was our first European symposium. And we noticed how cheap the scotch was in Scotland. <laughs> so, so, you know, Paul had bought a nice bottle of really good scotch, which would be very expensive to buy here. We became sedated. <laughs> <laughs> We were not euthanized. They're very clearly different. The next morning I could give a talk. It was all good. Next page. So what's, let's look at assisted suicide. So how is assisted suicide different from euthanasia? Assisted suicide is when somebody else is directly and intentionally involved with causing your death, but technically it's what you do to yourself. So it's a form of suicide. Assisted suicide, our law in Canada is section 241 of the criminal code. It says I cannot aid, I cannot counsel, and it says I cannot abet suicide, and abet would mean sort of encourage, right? So in Canada, you're not allowed to aid, counsel, or encourage someone to commit suicide, and I think that's a very good law. Let's think about all the different reasons someone might consider suicide, and consider how this law actually protects them. Uh, just two weeks ago, I was speaking in Niagara-on-the-Lake, beautiful place to speak, you know, wonderful place to go, and I was doing a similar talk, and this gentleman at the end of my talk comes up to me and said, and this is absolutely true, he comes up to me and says, in July, I unsuccessfully, I attempted to kill myself. He says, I took enough drug to kill myself. But somebody noticed that I stumbled, for some reason I decided to walk to my car, and someone noticed me stumbling to my car, called an ambulance, and they got me in time, and they pumped his stomach and all the rest of it. He says, but I took enough drug to kill myself, and I'm, and I'm thankful I'm here today. And I wanted to hear you speak. So it was just two weeks ago. And I said to him, well, you know, this law actually, in a sense, uh, protects you. Because if assisted suicide were legal, and if you were so intent on killing yourself, you could get somebody else to help you. Right? And if you're attempting suicide, most suicides fail. But if you could get someone to help you, well, they would ensure that the act were completed effectively. And you'd be dead, for sure. Right? So you have to think about how this law is designed to protect us and all the different reasons why someone might consider uh, suicide. But the other side likes to use terms like aid in dying. And they have the, a whole slew of terms which are nice and beautiful. Like the, the group in the U.S., the leading group in the U.S. to legalize assisted suicide, they're called Compassion and Choices. They used to be the Hemlock Society. But now they're Compassion and Choices. Well, that's a very good name. But they like to say aid in dying. And the reason is, is of course, they're trying to make you feel better about the act of assisted suicide. Because aid in dying could also mean palliative care. Aid in dying could mean many things. But you see, if you change the terminology, change the euphemism, it makes you feel different. I'm going to move on. So we need to be clear about this. what this is. Uh, the leading bioethicist of our day is Peter Singer. What does Peter Singer say? He says, there is no difference between killing and letting die. Now you've probably heard that before, no difference between killing and letting die. He says they're morally equivalent. In fact, uh, many of our leading bioethicists in Canada, of course, agree with that statement. There's no difference between killing and letting die. Now, if there is no difference between killing and letting die, then the argument is we do basically the same as euthanasia every day. Why not just legalize it and regulate it? That's the argument. But I ask you the question, is there a difference between killing and letting die? Because I believe that's a fallacy. It's a fallacy. It's a modern fallacy. Something that's taught in universities by people who wear, well, they don't wear white jackets anymore. They don't wear jeans and t-shirts. But I mean, people who, uh, who are your professors were going to teach you this. How do we know there's a big difference between killing and letting die? Well, I mentioned uh, before the medical treatment question. I'm going to give you a difficult, a difficult moral question. If someone were to withdraw a ventilator, would that be different than euthanasia? Yes. Now, why is it different? Now, event why do I say a ventilator? Because a ventilator is a very tough moral question. If I was talking about something which is an easier moral question, well, then the answer would come very nice and easy. But a ventilator, if you withdraw a ventilator, what happens if you withdraw a ventilator from somebody? Do they always die? No. Do they die immediately? Sometimes, but often not. Often they continue living. And in fact, about 10% of the time, they don't die at all, according to the stats. They just continue, well, they, we all die eventually. I mean, but I mean, according to the stats, they, they don't die. 
Well, if you give me a lethal dose, what happens to me? I'm dead. So obviously, in the, in the reality of life, in the uh, living of everyday life, we know there's a big difference between killing somebody and letting them die. We know there's a difference. And there's also a difference in intention. When you withdraw treatment, the intention is often there's no purpose for the treatment. That's a big difference from giving somebody a lethal in injection with the intention of causing their death. Very different intention. Move on. So Bill 52 is in, was the bill that was in Quebec that passed in June. And uh, you might have noticed that the media always referred to it as assisted suicide. Did anybody ever see the media ever call it euthanasia? No. Well, it is euthanasia and it's not assisted suicide. Okay, now I'm not saying there's huge moral differences between the two, but there's a difference. So the media always referred to it as assisted suicide or they'd call it medical aid in dying, you know, these type of terms. But remember, in the Quebec bill, what they've done is they've followed the Belgium model of euthanasia. And they decided, and the Quebec government decided to leave the Assisted Suicide Act alone. Probably for a couple reasons. The first reason I think is probably because of the Supreme Court Rodriguez decision. You know, if you're going to challenge the federal government in the federal court, you're probably better to leave the Rodriguez decision alone while it was still in play, right? So, they, so in fact, the Bill 52 specifically does not allow assisted suicide, it allows euthanasia. It allows a doctor to lethally inject somebody, okay? So it allows homicide. And what they did is they redefined that as medical treatment. So let's think this through. Redefining lethal injection as medical treatment. Now, when they put the bill together, if you read through the bill, you'll notice there's a section of the bill which redefines the term medical treatment in Quebec law. And the reason was is because the previous definition of medical treatment did not include things like lethal injection to kill you. <laughs> it actually was the opposite of that. So they had to redefine what medical treatment meant in Quebec law. And so why are they calling it medical treatment? Well, it's quite obvious that the federal government deals with criminal law, and under criminal law, you find euthanasia as a form of homicide. Whereas the provincial governments deal with health care. So if you want to legalize euthanasia as a province, you have to redefine the act as health care and say now it's health care and we can do this. Which in fact is a very interesting situation. They said, but we also have created in the bill a right to end of life care. Well I think everybody in this room, whether they're in favor of euthanasia or is this a suicide or opposed, probably would support good end of life care. The point is that they defined euthanasia as part of end of life care. So let's think this one through. If you're going to give somebody a right to end-of-life care, is that not a little different than saying we're going to encourage better end-of-life care? If you give me a right to something, is that a, a greater step? The answer is yes, of course. If I have a right to something, I could demand it, right? If it's simply an option, I just have to hope it's available to me. But if you're going to define euthanasia as part of end-of-life care, that means I can also demand euthanasia. That means I also have a right to euthanasia. They said it was only for, for uh, people who with a terminal illness, for end of life. In fact, it's interesting how the sort of political things work with that Bill 52. When the Liberals won that last election, the Liberal leader had voted against the earlier version of the Bill 52. And so what he did is he said, well, you have to make sure it's for end of life only, and then I'll support it. So they adjusted the bill to say end of life. But they never defined end of life. So you can see in the bill it says end of life. So you would assume it's people who are only terminally ill. But if you don't define end of life, does it mean only people who are terminally ill? There are a lot of people who have end of life conditions who are not terminally ill. Right? It's clear. That's, that's how it is. We're human beings. So if you don't define it, the other thing is it says physical and psychological suffering. What does psychological suffering mean? Can anybody debate, uh, d define end of life and psychological suffering? Can anybody define that? No. So when I get into what's going on in other jurisdictions, you're going to see how this term psychological suffering has bloated into euthanasia for anything. And in fact, it's in the bill already. It started there. I can even give you a little bit of history about it, but I don't think we all have all night. But I have a history professor introduce me, so maybe I should mention it very quickly. So I'll mention very quickly that you might know that no, I'll, I'll wait a second. And it uses the term incurable serious illness, the Bill 52. Incurable serious illness. 
Well, it didn't define end of life, and it says you must have an incurable serious illness. Well, there's lots of people with an incurable serious illness who are, have, that might lead to an end of life situation who are not terminally ill. Diabetes. Diabetes. Depends on their type of, absolutely, yes. Liver conditions. Yeah, liver condition. Oh, I'm getting a few right coming at me. Absolutely. <laughs> we move on. Justice Smith. So the Supreme Court of Canada just recently heard the Carter case. I'll give you a quick understanding of the Carter case. Uh, in um, the year 2010, Kay Carter, she was in her 90s. She was not terminally ill. She did have um, degenerative, um, uh, degenerative uh, muscles and back situations, so she had a lot of chronic pain. She went to Switzerland and died by assisted suicide at the Dignitatis Assisted Suicide Clinic. And then her family launched the Carter case. And what they did is they got the BC Civil Liberties Association to agree to be their lawyers. And they went before Justice Smith and she agreed they had a case. They said that, that technically they had broke the law because they arranged the assisted suicide. That's how they defined it, because they arranged the assisted suicide. Technically they broke Canada's assisted suicide law. But because no one in the family had been charged, and because Kay Carter was dead already, Justice Smith did say, well, you have a case, but there's nothing pending here. There's nothing, no pressure here. There's no, there's no imminent issue here before us. So in fact, this case could have taken forever. So then they found Gloria Taylor. Gloria Taylor had ALS, and they put an addendum to the case to include Gloria Taylor, and then Justice Smith fast-tracked the case. And that's how it happened, okay? So anyway, she decided in June of 2012, now remember, the, it said it was the BC Supreme Court, but you have to understand it's all about language. The BC Supreme Court is the lower federal court in British Columbia. In Ontario, we don't call our lower federal court the Supreme Court. They do there. So it started there. She decided that as the assisted suicide law in Canada was unconstitutional because it denied people with disabilities equality under the law. So what the argument was, since able-bodied people could commit suicide without assistance, therefore the Assisted Suicide Act denied them equality, people with disabilities. Now there's one big problem that I hope the Supreme Court is smart enough to recognize, I really hope. There is no right to suicide in Canada. Since there is no right to suicide, how come you could then have a discrimination on the Assisted Suicide Act? If you don't have a right to suicide, how can you be denied something you don't have a right to? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't hold. It's illogical. Okay? She also said we have to legalize a limited form of euthanasia. Now, did you ever see in the media where they ever once said that the case was about both euthanasia and assisted suicide? No, they always said assisted suicide. And there's a reason for that, because once you start digging in and you realize that euthanasia is a form of homicide, some people are more questioning about that. She, she, uh, Justice Smith said we needed a limited form of euthanasia. Why? Because some people are not able to kill themselves with assistance. They would require euthanasia, lethal injection. Then she ordered the federal government to legalize it by, in one year. And in fact, they appealed the decision, so of course that didn't happen. And then she gave Gloria Taylor a constitutional exemption to die by euthanasia or assisted suicide. Now, Gloria Taylor did die. Did she die by euthanasia or assisted suicide? No. What did she die of? No, she had an infection. She had ALS, right? Yeah, she had an infection, yeah. She had an infection. And she just decided to have no treatment for her infection. She died then a natural death. She didn't need euthanasia or assisted suicide. The Royal Society of Canada did a report on euthanasia and assisted suicide. It was a one-sided report. In fact, when the Royal Society of Canada had announced this committee they had put together to look at the question of euthanasia and assisted suicide, I wrote an article saying, well, why does the Royal Society of Canada bother giving this committee money to do this research when they appointed these seven people who were all pro-euthanasia? I said, why don't they just give the money to me and I'll write the article for them right now. Now, if you're going to appoint seven pro-euthanasia people to be on a committee to write about euthanasia, you're going to get a pro-euthanasia report. Like, it's quite obvious. Then you have the, the uh, Quebec Government Select Committee on Dying with Dignity. You had the commission in the UK called the Falconer Commission. Now, you might know right now there's a bill in the UK to legalize assisted suicide. Who's the sponsor of the bill? 
Lord Falconer, right. Well, Falconer's been pro-euthanasia and assisted suicide for a long time, and he got a bunch of his pro-euthanasia friends together, and he put together a commission. And, of course, it came out with that response because, once again, it was a one-sided commission. And then, of course, Justice Lynn Smith. And they all said that euthanasia or assisted suicide should be legalized. They all said the same thing. They all said in jurisdictions where it's legal, there's no adverse effects on vulnerable patient groups. And they all said there's no proof that a slippery slope has or will occur. That's what they've all said. So I think we ought to look at the facts and see if what they have said is actually true. <laughs> we go on. So I'm going to look at this first study. It came out in 2010 out of Belgium. And this was a death study. So what this is, is this is a study that looked at every single death in the Flanders region of Belgium over a four month period. They sent 6,927 questionnaires. So they sent a five page questionnaire to the primary physician dealing with every single, every single death. So this is a situation where the doctor had this patient, they get a questionnaire asking how that patient died and they send it back anonymously. So it's a clear study that you don't have to worry about what you're writing. The questions were not just dealing with euthanasia and assisted suicide, that was only one small section of the study. They got 3,623 responses. So that's a lot of data, right? That's an awful lot of data. Of that, they found out of that, there was 137 euthanasia deaths, five assisted suicide deaths, and 66 assisted deaths without request. That's a lot. Yes, sir? For the purpose of the study, what's the difference between an assisted death and a euthanasia death? Okay. So 137 deaths were defined as euthanasia. So euthanasia requires request. There was no request in these. So therefore, these are deaths without request. And that's what they said. So what they were is these are assisted deaths. These are intentional causing of death without request. Well, how is the so you have two, two, so the study says 208 total deaths were either euthanasia, assisted suicide, or assisted suicide, or assisted death without request. So what you have here is you have the intentional, the doctor admits that he intentionally caused the death of that patient, but he, there was no request involved. So therefore it cannot be euthanasia. 208 is the total number. So what you get is 66 of the 208 were done without request. Okay. Who, who completed the, request, the questionnaire? The doctor. So what it is is you have the primary physician reporting, and these are all anonymously done. So the doctor is sending in the questionnaire to the research group, and they do not then have any, how it's done, there's supposed to be no connection between who answered the questionnaire and what it is supposed to be anonymously done. So therefore you have this situation where they're finding out more about these deaths. And we should move on. If you want to know a lot about it, you can purchase my book. <laughs> right here, it's called Exposing Vulnerable People to Euthanasia and Assisted Suicide. I go through all these studies, but here I'm just going through it in a cursory manner because, of course, we're not going to be here all night together as much as we might like each other. It's going to get very hot in this room after a little while, okay? So what you have is you have euthanasia deaths and without explicit request occurring, and they're proving this in the study. Who were these people? Who were the ones who died? without request. Well, 70.1% of the time, the case, the person was either comatose, and 21% of the time they had dementia. So who were they? They were people who could not have asked for it in any way, shape, or form. They were incompetent, okay? Some of the reasons physicians, now of course I go through a lot more in my book. I'm just giving you the highlights here. Some of the reasons physicians euthanize the patient without request. was well, 17% of the time the physician said they thought it was in the best interest of the patient. Okay, 8.2% of the time the physician did not even discuss it because they said the discussion would have been harmful. Nurses were more involved in the administration of drugs in these deaths. Now what's important about that line, because in the Belgium law, the Belgium law is actually very, very clear. Only doctors can do it. So the question is, is when it shows up that nurses did it, then you have a question of are they following the law, right? We move on. They said in the study, the use of life funding drugs without an explicit patient quest request often involved patients with diseases other than cancer, which had an unpredictable end of life trajectory. Well, they already said these were people who had, were mainly um, comatose, dementia. Obviously, they're saying we did not know how long they would have lived. 
on average. Our finding that the use of life-finding drugs without explicit patient request, this is from the study, occurred predominantly in the hospital among patients 80 years or older who were mostly in coma or had dementia. And then the study says, this fit the description of a vulnerable patient group at risk of life funding without request. Now that's right in the study. It says that. Now what's important here is you have the Royal Society of Canada, you've got Justice Lynn Smith, you've got the Felkner Commission, and all these other groups all saying there's no signs of any groups, vulnerable patient groups, at risk of life funding without request. No sign of it, they said. Yes, sir. In terms of prolonged coma in the United States, are finances ever involved? Well, th this is a Belgian thing. I'm assuming, yeah, I'm assuming that finances are always uh, part of the elephant in the room. I'm assuming. But who are these people? I ask you the question because it's quite important, actually. Who are the people who are incompetent, tend to be on average over the age of 80, in a hospital? Who are they? We have the same thing happening in Canada. We've got people who are in beds, who you can't transfer because we've got nowhere to put them, who are competent, incompetent, and uh, we have, if they have an unpredictable end of life trajectory, we don't know how long they're going to live. We don't know where to put them, so they're in a hospital. And what, what do we call them? We'll call them bed blockers. Well, some might call it, depending on their condition. We move on. It's an important point. We have the same thing here. Well, Justice Smith actually dealt with the question. If you read Justice Smith's long judgment, she, you can tell that she was trying to do something when she wrote like a almost 400 page judgment. Like what's a judge doing writing a massive, massive book like that? You're supposed to be dealing with just the issue, right? Anyway, number 576 of her judgment, she looks at this, she says, because she was dealing with the question of vulnerable patient groups, because she said in her, her decision that if there were proof that vulnerable patient groups would be at risk, then we can't go this way. So she's looking at it, she says, well finally I note that Professor Delian, he's one of the researchers, and they cross-examined him. Was asked about the comment of the study that the use of life-ending drugs without explicit request occurred predominantly in a hospital and among patients 80 years or older who were mostly on coma or dementia and that this fit the uh, description of a vulnerable patient group at risk of life-ending without request. So she's facing it head on. Now, if you're trying to legalize something, if you're, if you're philosophically disposed to say that we must have this, and this is your goal in life to legalize this, how do you deal with bad news? Because this is bad news for her. Let's go to the next slide. This is how she dealt with it, 577. Next section of her decision. What does she say? His response to this line of questions suggested that possibly he did not wish to admit that he had said that patients who are 80 years or older are vulnerable at risk of Lauer. Lauer is life ending without request. Right? I take into account that P Professor Delian was ill was being cross-examined by video link in English. This is her decision. I didn't make this up. This is word for word from her decision. Not his first language. Perhaps for those reasons or perhaps because of impartiality. His response in this one area did not seem wholly straightforward. Well, you know, it's foolish because the study said it. It didn't matter what he had said to her when he was being cross-examined. It didn't make a difference. It says it right in the research. And if you look at the data, the data is clear. They weren't making it up. The data is clear. But let's go on. The next study we look at is the role of nurses in physician-assisted deaths in Belgium. Now, how many of you have done some serious research? I know you have. There's a few hands up. Ver, if you have two studies done on two totally separate groups that come up with exactly the same answer, would you not say that that's probably pretty good confirmation? Well, it's called concordance. Very good, thank you. So we have this study done on nurses. They sent questionnaires to 1,678 nurses in Belgium. 1,265 acceptable responses. So that's a lot of data. Good data, okay? Lots of data. 248 nurses reported that the last patient in their care died by euthanasia. Now that's huge. Almost half, 120, 45%. We reported that the last patient in their care died by euthanasia without explicit request. Significant. Huge. Massive. Now, I point out that you might have a tiny bit of over-reporting in this study. The first study was excellent. The first study is if Alex died in Belgium, my doctor would be sent a questionnaire about my death. So it's dealing with a person 
of responsible that death. This is dealing with their experience with their last patient in their care. You might get two nurses who might have dealt with that same patient. You might have, there might be some over-reporting. It's possible, but nonetheless, it's <coughs> massive, huge, okay? 14 of the cases, the nurses admitted, admitted to injecting the patient, which is illegal in Belgium. Only doctors. The law is very clear. Only doctors. Okay? Yes? Requests might have come from their substitute decision maker. And actually, that's a very good point. I'll, I should get to that. And I should answer that now. Yes, that is very possible. But the Belgium law is actually very clear. This actually was actually a question that was put to the respondents. There was a question put into the CMAJ. And if you go into my book, I actually deal with that whole question. So it was actually these Canadian researchers who challenged the study. And it was actually not this one, it was the previous study. And they challenged it saying, surely it must be the power of attorney. It could be family members who had requested it. And the researcher then explains, you're right. Uh, the proof shows that yes, in many cases the families did. But he pointed out, but it doesn't matter because the Belgium law is very clear. Request must come from the person, cannot come from somebody else. So it didn't matter. So he pointed out, yes, you're right. Families might have requested it, yes. Well, in any event, substitute decision making authorizes decisions that are for therapeutic purposes or other health related purposes, and death is not a therapeutic or health purpose. You're obviously not from Quebec, because in uh, Quebec they divided well, you. Well, this part of Belgium <laughs> can substitute decision yeah. for research yeah. purposes, and the substitute decision maker does not have legal authority yes. to give substitute consent to research that has no therapeutic purpose. But the point here, though, it continues, though, that in Belgium, it's, the law is actually quite clear that uh, a substitute decision maker cannot request. That is not a valid request. Okay? So therefore, it didn't matter. It was still ignoring the law. So we see here 14 of the cases the nurses admitted to injecting the patient, which is illegal in Belgium. So this is very important to point out. The law does not get followed, okay? We go to the next slide. So the study said, people who died by euthanasia without explicit request, so this is the nurse's study, were more likely to be over the age of 80 and die in a hospital, less likely to have had cancer. Same patient group, separate study, separate set of data, right? Separate set, separate set of questions, separate study. So you're seeing once again that they're showing that people who are li or likely over the age of 80 who are in a hospital who tended to not have cancer. Now you may say, what's the importance of not having cancer? Uh, most people who die by euthanasia have cancer. Most. In the Netherlands, it's about 80%. In Belgium, it's a little bit lower than that. But it's still the majority of those who die by euthanasia have cancer. They were, in this case, of course, they were dementia, coma. And then they write, it seems that the current law which does not allow nurses to administer life-ending drugs and a control system does not prevent nurses from administering life-ending drugs. Now this is from the study and obviously the data concludes this anyway. The point of it is, is they're not following the law. The law is not being followed. And we move on. And this is another study but it looked at a different part of the same data, the 3,623 deaths. So this study was only concerned about the reporting procedure and whether the law was being followed or not, okay? So this study looks at it and it concludes that of all those assisted deaths, the 208 assisted deaths that they found out of the 3,623 deaths, only 52.8% of them were actually reported. Now what's important about this is in Belgium, the reporting procedure is mandatory. Now let's answer the question for you, and actually I should probably have done this first. In Belgium, Netherlands, Oregon, Washington State, where these things are legal, there's a mandatory reporting procedure. Who sends in the report? The doctor. Thank you. The doctor who does the act sends in the report. When is the report sent in? After the fact. After the person has died. So, is this a safeguard to have a reporting procedure after the person has died? So they send in the report to show if the law is being followed or not. But you see, guess what? If I'm dead already and something wrong was done, you can't bring me back. So of course it's not a safeguard whatsoever. And in fact, there's one other big problem with this. Uh, when you guys were, like I came in from London, Ontario. And when I was driving on the 401, did I call the police to tell them I was speeding, please pick me up? <laughs> no, I didn't. Will doctors self-report abuse of the law? Are there any doctors in the room? Do doctors self-report abuse of the law? No. no. Okay, so when you ask a doctor to do euthanasia and then fill out the report of the euthanasia you did, 
and send it in after the person died, are they going to report, oh, by the way, I had nurse so-and-so do it, even though I know that's illegal. The person was not actually dying, probably wasn't even sick, but they did seem to want it. I didn't really ask. Are they going to do that? No, of course not. So, you know, the design of the law is not to find abuse. So this study was good because it was done anonymously and it was through a multiple question death study. So what did we find? We found that there was a significant relation between reporting of euthanasia and the patient's age. Patients who were over the age of 80, it was far less likely to be reported. Okay, very interesting. Now who was that group that was over the age of 80 on average? There's the same group of people who were killed without request. Same group. Okay? Is that, there a waiver that they have to sign? Pardon? Is there a waiver that they have to sign? Okay. The person who requests it? Well, you can, you can actually, it depends on where you are. In Belgium, you can actually request and it would put, put on your chart, okay? But in uh, Oregon, you have to actually have a written request. It has to be written, okay? Or signed or something, right? This means, because then they looked at the other question. Did they follow the law? So when they reported it, 73.1% of the time they actually followed the law. They actually did everything that the law required. See, often the doctors don't get a second doctor to agree to it. They might claim there was, but they don't have a second doctor agreeing. Or they didn't bother doing certain checks and things. They just didn't bother following the law, right? 73.1% of the time they followed the law when they reported it. When they didn't report it, they only followed the law 12.3% of the time. Very important little stat there. And we move on. So the same study that looked at reporting procedure, the researcher said, well, a similar study had been done in the Netherlands in 2004. So if you go through my book, you'll see I'm, I pulled up the data from the 2004 study because they did the same thing. And they said, well, let's look at this. And they found that there was a direct correlation between what the researchers in the Netherlands found in 2004 and what they found in Belgium in 2010 was that doctors who don't report a case never intended to report the case. They just never intended to report it. So you have a case which is sort of gray area. You did something which may or may not be acceptable, so you don't report. They never intended to report. And that was just very important that it shows that in fact in the Netherlands and Belgium, the reason for not reporting on, on majority cases were that they simply never intended to in the first place. They just didn't. In fact, there's this doctor in Belgium, which is very interesting, Dr. Cousins. There was this big kerfuffle in Belgium in February, very interesting that uh, Dr. Wim Disselmans, who's like the, uh, how would you say, the guru of euthanasia in Belgium, he actually is the head of the euthanasia committee. He actually also runs the euthanasia clinic. So, you know, how much can you trust the results and the information coming out of that euthanasia committee in Belgium that oversees the law, when the guy who runs the euthanasia clinic is also the president and chairman of the euthanasia committee? Hmm. Is he going to put himself into trouble for what he's done? Of course not. Anyway, Dr. Cousins on national media was saying, I do euthanasia, but I never report it. I never report it. And Dr. Disselmans is saying, but you have to report it. The law requires you to. And he says, I don't report it. I consider it to be private between myself and my patients. I don't report. Now, that was February. Today, now it's beginning of November. Has Dr. Cousins been arrested, investigated? No, nothing, no. So anyway, then they say in the end of the study, legislation alone does not seem sufficient to reach the goal of transparency. 100% transparency seems to be a rather utopian ideal. Now that's from the Belgium study. Now let's think this through. I'm being told all the time, you know, Alex, you don't want euthanasia or assisted suicide, that's fine. But I want euthanasia or assisted suicide, so don't impose your morality on me. I'm being told that all the time. Now let's think this through. Because my response to that is, yes, but I don't live in a utopia. Because it's a utopian ideal to assume that whatever law you pass will be followed. So if you legalize euthanasia, there will be collateral damage, and I don't want that to be me. Okay? And there's other arguments against that are actually better than that one. But when they're saying, hey, keep your morality away from me. I'm saying, you can't protect me. Belgium studies prove it. You can't protect me. We move on. Okay. In 2013, Belgium euthanasia report indicated that the number of reported euthanasia deaths in Belgium had increased by 26.8% in 2013 to 1,816. Now remember, that's his reported. 
It's very important to mention reported deaths because, of course, there's a lot of unreported deaths. Okay? At the same time, the Bel Belgium had recently extended euthanasia to children. You know that they have, in Belgium, they just extended it to children. So yes. It's like, uh, I have to, I didn't bring a, I think it's like June or something like that. Okay. It just passed, right? Eh? Yep. You can just Google it, it comes right up. Whether it's the child euthanasia bill was passed after protests against the bill. 160 Belgian pediatricians denounced the child euthanasia bill. Now, how many, how many Belgian pediatricians are there? <laughs> Because it's a small country. I'm assuming that means most of them. Now I know there was a couple, so let's put this all together. Politically what happened is there was, there was a few pediatricians who had come out saying, uh, we have to change the law because we've been forced to do this already. They used that force majeure type ar uh, argument that we had children who are born with these disabilities who are suffering and because of the suffering we had to euthanize them we've had to do this already you must change the law that's what they were arguing but there was only a few of them arguing that 160 came up I'm gonna give you another little insight to this you know how politics changes everything well in Belgium this bill when it originally came out if you go to my blog and you look up Belgium euthanasia and you go back about two years you see what was I writing about? I was writing about the Belgium euthanasia bill that sought to legalize euthanasia for children and people with dementia. The original bill included both. And then for political reasons, they dropped the section about people with dementia because they figured maybe that was one too many things to take on at once, I don't know. So now what are they talking about in Belgium? Euthanasia for people with dementia. We move on. What about these guys here? Mark and Eddie Verbussen. How many of you remember this case? Yeah. It was in the media here in Canada. Most of the major me media certainly covered it. On December 14, 2012, these identical twins died by euthanasia in Belgium. Now let's put this together. They were born deaf. They are twins who spent their whole life together. They were both cobblers. They lived together. Now they're going blind. Now they weren't blind yet, but they were going blind. And they decided it was too great a level of psychological suffering to go blind. Psychological suffering. They were given euthanasia for what reason? Because they were physically ill? No. Because they were terminally ill? No. Because of psychological suffering. Okay? They lived together. Now, was this euthanasia case the right decision? Let's think this through. Uh, oh, I think I'll answer it for you later. We'll move on. And G. How is that last called depression? Okay, but depression is considered a form of psychological suffering and you can actually have euthanasia for depression in Belgium if you use that argument. You're going to see my next story, okay? So Anne G was 44 years old. This is such a crazy story. I wish it weren't true, but it is true. She had anorexia nervosa. This gentleman here was her psychiatrist. He was supposedly an expert in anorexia. Anne had accused Dr. Van der Eiken of exploiting her sexually. And he also, she also accused him of having sexual relations with several other patients. It didn't go well for Anne. Now, I'll be straight with you. I wasn't part of any of their relationships. I don't know for sure what happened. All I know is Anne asked for euthanasia, not because of anorexia. She said the whole process of what she went through with the uh, sexual exploitation, the the, uh, the complaints that she had put in, how it didn't go well. She said it was such a great level of su psychological suffering. She said she wanted to die by euthanasia. And she was approved for euthanasia. And died by euthanasia. Dr. Van Der Eiken is seeing patients. Now that seems pretty crazy, doesn't it? I should ask you the question though. In 2002, now let's think this through. Quebec is following the Belgian model of euthanasia. That's what they're doing. That's when you look at the two, you say, gosh, they're following the Belgian euthanasia law. When you see the Quebec bill, how it was written, and the Belgium law. In 2002, when Belgium legalized euthanasia, were they thinking that someone like Anne would be dying by euthanasia? No. No, they weren't, they weren't thinking of that at all. And certainly it wasn't being sold that way at all. It was being sold only for people who were terminally ill and suffering. And in fact, in the very first year of euthanasia in Belgium, there was only a little over 100 deaths. And then it grew and grew and grew and grew. So we move on. 
Dr. Tom Mortier, his mother died by euthanasia. She was depressed. Now the terrible thing about this case is uh, that Tom had no idea that his mother was seeking euthanasia. So what happened is, is that she had been going through uh, long-term depression throughout her life, you know, off and on. She had been a teacher, though. She was retired as a teacher. Now, are there any retired teachers here? Now, Tom sent me that picture because he said that when she retired, she did a lot of traveling. She had a little bit of money. She did have a man in her life. She had a long-term relationship going on. It had been a long-term relationship. And she enjoyed traveling. He actually sent me several pictures. If you go to my blog, you'll see it several times I use a different picture, a few other pictures of, of Tom's mother in different places where she went to travel. And she always has a smile on her face. She's happy. She's traveling. That long-term relationship of hers broke up. And she broke up all relations with anybody of her family. And she was seeking euthanasia. She was in deep depression. She asked her psychiatrist for euthanasia. And he said no. He said no. She went to another psychiatrist and asked for euthanasia. And he said no. So what did she do? She went to the euthanasia clinic. Who runs the euthanasia clinic? Wim Disselmans, the guru of euthanasia in Belgium. And they sent her to their psychiatrist who said yes. And she died by euthanasia. Now here's the shock. Why has, so Tom's let, launched a, a legal case against uh, the Belgium euthanasia law and to the European Court of Human Rights. And he says, you know, it, it's a shock for many reasons. One, his mother wasn't sick. Uh, she was denied by her psychiatrist of euthanasia. You can't just sort of meet a, a, a psychiatrist and then die a few days later by euthanasia. How could that be anything but ridiculous? And he says, how was this for his family? His mother, his, sorry, his, his wife was home on April 20th. They got a phone call asking, what are we going to do with your mother's body? And he's like, what? My mom's not even sick. Now, were they thinking in 2002 of a case like this for euthanasia when they legalized euthanasia in Belgium? No, of course not. And we move on. Recent other deaths, well, I mentioned here about the, uh, Dr. Dis Disselman's death here. What really makes it interesting when you look at the case, see, Tom did a lot of research into this because he was wanting to launch a case against Disselman's. And he did. And then he's launched the case to the Hu Human Rights Commission. So he's done a ton of research into this. His mother sent a donation of 2,500 euro to the Life End Information Forum. What's the Life End Information Forum? It's the euthanasia clinic. They like good names, right? They don't want to call it a euthanasia clinic. They call it the Life End Information Forum. You know, watch what you call something. Which is an organization co-founded by Disselmans. She was depressed. Was this not an apparent conflict of interest? Accepting the donation and then killing the person? We move on. In September in Belgium, Frank van den Bleeken, how many of you noticed that? He's a convicted rapist and murderer in Belgium. He decided he wanted euthanasia. Why? Because he said that no matter what happens, whatever treatment they've given him, he continues to desire having sex with children. So he said he will never be released from jail. And because he said he'll never be released from jail, that's too great a level of psychological suffering. He wanted euthanasia. Now remember, the death penalty is illegal in Belgium. And uh, he was approved for euthanasia. Now maybe, just maybe, they should have looked at it another way. You were sent to jail because you were to do time for your crime. And if that was a form of suffering, that was your punishment for these terrible crimes of murder and rape. Maybe. Another prisoner has now also requested euthanasia. Who's, this is a prisoner who's currently served 27 years for murdering two people. Uh, these are different because there, were, there has been already euthanasia deaths of prisoners, but those people were terminally ill. These guys are not terminally ill. They're not sick. They're just wanting euthanasia. <coughs> Recent case, healthy couple, died by euthanasia. Their son, John Paul, is 55, approached their doctor, request euthanasia. Nice son. But the doctor refused because there was no grounds for it. So John Paul found another doctor willing to perform the killing of an unnamed, at an unnamed hospital in Flanders. It was probably the euthanasia clinic doctor who was contacted because they're easy to find. <coughs> John Paul said the double euthanasia of his parents was the best solution. If one of them should die, the one who would remain would be so sad and totally dependent on us. <laughs> How old are you, Barry? 
85? <laughs> anyway, these, they weren't sick. They weren't dying yet. Yes? Was, uh, statistic, uh, in Flanders. Yes. The geography reminds me the, the Flemish people of uh, Belgium are only about 60% of the population. Right, the, the others are the Walloons, yeah, the yeah, French. Why much there? Is it because of the commonality of the Netherlands, Dutch language? Well, there's a lot of debate about they that. Control? There's a lot of debate about that, and it has a lot to do, I think, with the fact mm -hmm. that the Walloons are supposedly a different culture than the, than the uh, Flemish section of Belgium. I don't know. I'm not an expert on that. Uh, uh, we'll talk to someone else who's an expert on that one. Yes? I'm having a hard time drawing distinction between this and a mafia hitman. Uh, John Paul is not Italian. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll move on. We'll move on. On November 23rd, I debated Dr. Jan Bernheim in, uh, in Brussels. Dr. Bernheim was one of the gurus of the early euthanasia movement. He was one of the guys who made sure it got legalized. And I contacted him on purpose because I knew how important he was in 2002 to the legalization of euthanasia in Belgium. Uh, during the debate, I used many of the facts I just used with you. And I quoted from these Belgium studies and I told different stories that what we had. And at the end of the debate, Bernheim responded, well, at the end of my comments, you know, you're supposed to come up and respond. He comes up there and he says, there are problems with the Belgium euthanasia law. And of course I said, that is cold comfort for the dead. Let's look at the Netherlands. This is a study that came out in 2012. It's of the 2010 stats, okay? So every five years in the Netherlands, they do this meta-analysis. So once again, I said, if you're trying to find abuse of the law, you can't find it from the actual reports, because the actual reports come from the data from the doctors who did it, and doctors don't self-report abuse. So the euthanasia movement always quotes those reports. It's all they ever quote. And therefore, they always say, oh, no sign of abuse. Guess what? Those reports won't show the abuse. This study, every five years, they do. So the first one was in 1990 called the Remmerlink Report. The, 2000, the 1995 port report was called the Vondermaas Report. They look at it, uh, a, they send questionnaires to physicians, okay? And this report showed in 2010, 23% of the uh, deaths were done, were not reported. 23% were not reported in 2010. So this is a very important little stat. Because the 2005 report showed 20% were not reported. So in the Netherlands, it's not quite as bad as Belgium, you'd have to say then, but still, 23% are not reported. So when we're talking about abuse of the law, what cases are probably not reported? The cases that are the abuse of the law are less likely to be reported, for sure, if we look at the other studies. The reported euthanasia deaths in the Netherlands. Now what was interesting about this is this was published in The Lancet in July of 2012. If you go to The Lancet and actually read this article, the whole thing, it shows you all the stats, you're going to notice that the conclusion in The Lancet is that euthanasia in the Netherlands has remained steady. Because the authors wanted to make you think that everything is remaining steady. That is only so many people who ask for euthanasia, don't worry about it, those numbers don't really climb. Now this was, of course, a lie. And I was laughing my guts out, other than the fact that every single major newspaper who reported on this study said it's been remained steady. That was their comment. You go back to the National Post, Global Mail, the American papers, the British papers, it's always the same quote, remain steady. Yet, 2006, there had been 1,923 reported euthanasia deaths. 2007, 21, 20. 2008, 23, 31. Of course, 2010, 31, 36, 2011, 36, 95, 2012, 4,088, now 2013, 4,829. Does not look too steady. It's steadily increasing. Steadily increasing. And it's not only increasing by number, it's increasing on what kind of deaths are allowed for euthanasia. Okay, that's very important. So it's not steady other than it's steadily going up. We move on. You see, if, you just, if I just showed you that slide, you wouldn't have known what the actual study was trying to say to you. And I'm trying to say, if you go to my book, you'll see I'm quoting them exactly. It says steady, and it's like, how could that be? 2013, they reported 42 euthanasia deaths in the Netherlands for people with psychiatric problems. It's an important stat, because in the very beginning, there was never deaths in the Netherlands 
for psychiatric problems, at least ones that were reported never were like that. They didn't allow it. 97 euthanasia deaths of people with dementia in 2013. They're allowing euthanasia for people with dementia. The Dutch Medical Association extended euthanasia to babies born with disabilities in 2005. Groningen Protocol it was. And now they're discussing euthanasia for children. And they're also talking about forcing doctors to refer for euthanasia. It's a big debate right now. And there's one other big debate that was just a couple years ago. And that was what? People who are tired of living. I guess that would be the case like I showed you in Belgium where the 55 year old son arranged for his parents to be euthanized. Supposed tired of living. Hmm. And I thought this was about choice and autonomy. Do babies choose death? Do people with dementia choose to die? Do people with psychiatric problems, are they competent? That's the kind of person perhaps that they are using. Okay, I can actually go, I'm not, I didn't actually bring my slides on the Groningen Protocol because that actually deals with it. And if, you, if you're looking at the question of who's being euthanized, what you had is you had two court cases, give me one second Adrian, you've got two court cases that happened in the mid-90s in Belgium dealing with babies who had been euthanized. So one was a child with trisomy 13 and the other one was a child with, with uh, spina bifida. That was the Prinz case. Okay? So what happens in the case of the Prinz case is that was the case that set the precedent. So when you read the Groningen Protocol in 2005, you see this coming out, and you read it through, and, it, and it's a published document. You can read it, you can just Google it, it comes right up. You'll see that the Groningen Protocol is based on 22 children who were born with spina bifida who had been euthanized, and that's what they based the protocol on. So when we're talking with children with hydrocephalus or whatever like that, these are cases that are often they wouldn't treat, and they would die naturally reasonably quick. But nonetheless, in the case of the Groningen Protocol, it was based on spina bifida itself. So let's go on. You asked me a question about this thing about being forced to refer. Right now in Belgium, doctors must refer euthanasia. They don't have a choice. They don't have to do it, but they must refer. In the Netherlands, they don't have to do it and they don't have to refer. So there's a lot of discussion about the referral question in, uh, in the Netherlands. So just so you know about Bill 52 in Quebec, I'll give you one second. Bill 52 in, in Quebec does not give a doctor the right not to refer. Bill 52 says that if a doctor is asked for euthanasia, and they're not going to do it, they must inform their superior, so that somebody in the hospital or somebody in the medical system who's been appointed, they must inform them that someone named so-and-so had asked for euthanasia, and then, so they don't have the right to say, I will have nothing to do with it. They must inform somebody. So that's what's going on in the Netherlands, this question about denying euthanasia to somebody. That's the question that's going on right now. It's being debated, and we move on. We move on. Uh, these questions are all very interesting, but there will be time at the end for questions and comments. So I would ask that you wait till the end and let Alex finish. finish yeah, because I'm already about an hour in, so we've yeah. got to get this done. Okay, so we look at the, the issue of depression. This is a study in the Netherlands. It's a very good study because Dr. Vanderlee is pro euthanasia. So it's what Vanderlee looked at, she was trying to prove that euthanasia and depression were not connected. That was her attempt. That's what she was trying to prove. So what she did is she, she was an oncologist and she, in her study, she admits in the beginning that their clinical impression was that requests for euthanasia were based on well-considered decision, decisions and not depression. So what did she find? She found that, to our surprise, that a depressed mood was associated with more requests. So that actually shouldn't be a surprise. If I'm going through a, a, a major life limiting experience, I might become depressed. I'm a normal human being. But patients with a depressed mood were associated with a four times greater risk of requesting euthanasia. So this is an important study because it said that was, that's a 400% increased risk of requesting euthanasia. And she concluded, pro-euthanasia doctor, depression is a primary risk factor for euthanasia and assisted suicide. And I think that's a very important study to look at because there's no research bias in it. So let's look at the Netherlands. In October 2013, the Dutch news story reported, that was just last year, that a woman was euthanized because she feared becoming blind. Now how many of you are Dutch? Okay, I'm half Dutch, so I guess I'm it. Okay. You're sort of Dutch? Okay. Because well, if you're Dutch, you understand this. If you're not, you don't. She was obsessed with cleanliness, and she said that she couldn't live without being able to clean the spots in her clothes. Okay? So here's my friend Amy Hasbrook. Amy was born blind. 
In the Netherlands, euthanasia is now become acceptable for going blind. That's an acceptable reason. Why? She said that she was obsessed with cleanliness. There was psychological suffering that gave her euthanasia. So going blind was a reason for euthanasia based on psychological suffering. Well, what does that mean to someone who is blind? Now euthanasia is a reason killing somebody can be done because you're blind or going blind. Now were they thinking of that person in 2002 when they legalized euthanasia in the Netherlands? Were they going to legalize it for someone going blind? Well, no. Recent uh, euthanasia, in an article published in the Dutch News, explained that this euth the euthanasia clinic was reprimanded for the death of an elderly woman who had a stroke. She died by euthanasia because she didn't want to live in a nursing home. So she had a stroke, but she wasn't dying. They were going to put her in a nursing home, and she said she wanted euthanasia. They agreed. I think it sounds like elder abuse to me. That's, that's how I would interpret it. A 35-year-old woman recently died by euthanasia because she had psychiatric issues. She died on December 19th. Now, the importance of this story was two psychiatrists had refused to do it. She ended up at the euthanasia clinic. We move on. A 54-year-old healthy woman with a personality disorder, an eating disorder, and a chronic obsessive compulsive neurosis died by euthanasia. She wasn't terminally ill. Now, obviously she had a lot of issues, but I mean, that is not a reason to kill somebody. When we're thinking of euthanasia, we think of people with eating disorders, chronic obsessive compulsive neurosis to be dying by euthanasia. Are we thinking of that? Is that what the media is saying to us? No. Physically healthy 63-year-old man who worked his whole life for the government, never had a relationship. The only thing he said he did was work. Now he's retired, he asks for euthanasia. Why? He said he has no reason to live. There's too great a level of psychological suffering. Um, how many of you know Margaret Somerville? My, many, the developer people certainly do. Yeah, because she spoke for you. You might know a little bit about Margaret Somerville. She loves cats. Okay, she loves cats. And she was doing a debate in the Netherlands just a couple years ago against this euthanasia doctor. And this euthanasia doctor was talking about this patient she had who was lonely and uh, wanting to die. And in the end, the doctor agreed to euthanasia. You know, and, she, I, and I guess they went through this whole story of how lonely she was and no one visited her and all the rest. And anyway, so Dr. Zummerville said, well, after the whole talk was done, I went over to her and said, did you think about there could be another way to handle this? And the, and the doctor's thinking, well, there might have been other ways. She said, well, did you think about giving her a cat? Now, you might laugh at that, but of course, Somerville loves cats. But the fact is, is this person is lonely, alone, given all their life to working for the government, has no relationship, and they die by euthanasia. We move on. Someone's going to hit my button. Move on. Okay, a study published in the Journal of Epidemiology explained in the data. Okay, this is a Swiss study. 16% of the assisted suicide deaths, the person had no underlying disease or condition. 16%. A similar study was done a few years earlier, published in 2008, and it found that 25% of the assisted suicide deaths, no underlying disease or condition. So Switzerland is a bit different than the Netherlands and Belgium because it's assisted suicide, not euthanasia. The other thing with Switzerland, it's done by these clinics. These, so they have the Dignatis Clinic, the Exit Clinic. These are, these are not, uh, how would you say, doctor-run places. Uh, Dignatis is run by Ludwig, Ludwig Minelli, who's a lawyer. Assisted suicide is more common with women. So this is the study that says 16% who are done who had no underlying disease or condition. Assisted suicide in Switzerland is done with people, uh, more commonly done to women, people who are divorced, living alone, more educated, no religious affiliation, and they tend to be wealthier. Okay? We move on. Swiss assisted suicide. Well, in April 24, uh, 2014, that's only a few months ago, a Swiss appeals court overturned a regional court conviction for a doctor who assisted suicide, who killed a man, Without a diagnosis. No diagnosis. So he was convicted by the lower court. And then he appealed it. And the appeals court overturned the decision. So the man argued that he told the regional court that he had acted out of compassion in prescribing a lethal dose to the elderly man who suffered pain, who had tried to commit suicide. He said, 
The man was suffering unbearable pain, but the doctor was unable to get a diagnosis of the patient's condition because the patient refused to allow him to treat him. So, you got a patient who's refusing to allow you to examine him or treat you, but he's asking for assisted suicide, so you go ahead and do it. You're convicted, and then it's overturned. Hmm. We move on. In May 2014, the Exit Assisted Suicide Group decided to allow deaths for elderly, healthy people. Okay? The Exit Group. The president of the Swiss Medical Association denounced the decision by Exit. But look, Dignitas was already doing it. So let's think this through. If the Dignitas Clinic's already doing it, and Exit was unwilling to do it, then it means Exit was losing business. So, in February 2014, this Italian woman who's 85, she traveled to the Dignitas Clinic, gave them 10,000, and died by assisted suicide because she was unhappy about how she looked. Now, I don't know about you, but there will be a time where I'm going to be unhappy with how I look. <laughs> but you're 85, so you're doing good. <laughs> In April 2013, Pietro D'Amico, another Italian, 62-year-old from Calabria, Calabria. 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 In southern Italy, he died by assisted suicide. His autopsy proved that he had had a wrong diagnosis. Now let's think this through. In today and age, if you have a wrong diagnosis, you might be given some bad medicine that you didn't need, or some medicine you just simply didn't need, I mean. And it might cause you some problems. But you might survive it. But if you're given a wrong diagnosis and you could die by assisted suicide, you're not coming back. You're not coming back. Now, I have to tell you something else about this. Assisted suicide in Switzerland is actually almost identical to euthanasia. Because all they do is in the clinic, and you show up, and they, they mix everything up for you. Everything's done. All you have to do is sip it, right? All you have to do is drink it. Nothing else. So that type of assisted suicide is actually almost identical to euthanasia. Okay? In March 2013, an 83-year-old British man with dementia died by assisted suicide at the Dignitas Clinic in Switzerland. And this doctor, Michael Irwin, he runs a group in the UK called Society for Old Age Rational Suicide. And he accompanied him. Yeah, let's all be a member of that group. We move on. Oregon. In 2013, there was 71 reported assisted suicide deaths. I say reported because there was actually some deaths that they didn't receive a report for. So they're not in the numbers as a death by assisted suicide. There was 122 lethal prescriptions filled. So the data shows 63 died by assisted suicide from a 2013 prescription. Eight died from the previous, uh, previous year's prescription. 28 died from other causes. 31 people, the status was unknown. Seven died, uh, of the 31, seven died with the status unknown. 24, the status was pending. So in seven cases, they have no idea actually what happened. Okay? They just don't know. 12 assisted suicide deaths of the 71 were related to other, uh, other illnesses which included chronic conditions in the, you go to the addendum at the bottom of the report. Remember, the report doesn't tell us much because it's done by the doctors who did the act. Nonetheless, it showed that at least one of the patients had diabetes. At least one. And it had a list of conditions at the bottom of other illnesses. 2008, Linda Ganzini did a study in, the, in uh, Oregon looking at depression and assisted suicide. 58 people had asked for assisted suicide joined her study and 15 of them were depressed. 26%. Now that should not surprise you that you would have a lot of people who are depressed who are asking for assisted suicide. The point of the study was to see the connection between assisted suicide and depression. 15 of 58. Now here's the other thing. The only reason they identify those 15 as depressed was because they joined her study. She was then doing investigation on them. In 2013, 71 people who died by assisted suicide, only two of them or offered a psychiatric or a psychological analysis. And you may say, so what, Alex? And I'll tell you, it's because the law requires it. The law says in Oregon, we don't assist the suicide of people with depression. Therefore, if there's any sign of depression, you must be sent for a psychiatric or psychological analysis. That's what the Oregon law says. But of the 71 who died in 2013, two were sent for an, for an assessment. And yet, Ganzini found 15 of 58 in her study were depressed. In Oregon stats so that show that in the last three years, only 2% of the patients who died by assisted suicide were referred for
for an evaluation, psychological or psychiatric evaluation. So in other words, people who are depressed are dying by assisted suicide. Let's move on. Suicide contagion effect. A Canadian study published in the CMHA May 21st, 2013 proved that there is a suicide contagion effect. It looked at all these questions. It did a whole bunch of series of uh, questionnaires with Canadians and it proves there is a clear suicide contagion effect. The study proved that the risk of suicide increased based on the closeness of the relationship to the person who died by suicide. So if you knew that person personally, you were more likely to consider suicide than if you did not know that person personally, etc. When applying this effect to Oregon, the suicide rate in Oregon has increased by 49% since the year 2000. The national increase in the U.S. has been 28%. There's very likely a suicide contagion effect going on. We move on. Well, what about elder abuse? April 2nd, 2013, Tammy Sawyer was arrested for elder abuse of Thomas Middleton. Thomas Middleton died by assisted suicide. Thomas Middleton had ALS, and Tammy took him in to live with her. She died within the month. He died within the month of moving in with Tammy Sawyer, but in that same time, he had signed everything over to her, and so after he died, two days after he died, she listed the house, and all the proceeds went to her. So when people say, oh, there's no connection between, oh, assisted suicide and elder abuse, well, we know for sure there's at least one. You know, and if we think about elder abuse, uh, is that not maybe one of the most vulnerable groups we have? And certainly with a growing problem with elder abuse? You went one too far. That's fine. 2008, Barbara Wagner was prescribed an aggressive cancer treatment for recurrent lung cancer. She was turned down by the state plan for her medical treatment. Now that is one issue. But the bigger issue was then the state then, when they turned her down in the same letter, they offered her assisted suicide. So, you know, what's interesting about this is the leader of Compassion and Choice is Barbara Coombs Lee. She wrote a letter explaining, well, what was Barbara, what was Barbara Wagner actually demanding extraordinary medical treatment for anyway? But of course, Barbara Wagner wasn't demanding extraordinary medical treatment. She was prescribed that and she was turned it down for it. But they were offering her assisted suicide. The question is, what was the state doing offering somebody assisted suicide? If it's all about a free choice, why should the state be involved with offering it? Dr. Benz had a long-term patient who was depressed who died by assisted suicide. This is a very important case that Dr. Benz wrote up. Dr. Benz was the primary physician. He, he, uh, he, he had, um, uh, what happened is his patient, uh, he had diagnosed with cancer. He saw this patient again and he noted how depressed this patient was and he wanted to treat his patient for depression. He had sent his patient to a cancer specialist for treatment and he got a phone call from the cancer specialist asking for him to be the second signature on the assisted suicide form. Dr. Ben said, no, my patient does not qualify for assisted suicide. My patient is depressed. And according to the law, he's right. His patient did not qualify. His patient died 15 days later by assisted suicide. So what happened? Well, that cancer specialist simply called another doctor. Got a signature. All it, see, the law only requires two signatures. And you would say, well, that's just, they always say, oh, it's a safety net. We'll have safeguards. Alex, don't worry about this. There'll be safeguards. Well, the doctor was a bit foolish to call up Dr. Benz asking for the second signature because he wasn't on the list of doctors who support it. Right? Compassion Choices has a list of doctors who support it. So the fact is that they just doctor shop, found another doctor. Jeanette Hall was terminally ill, wanted to die by assisted suicide in 2000. She wanted to die. She said she voted in favor of it. I might actually have her slide here. We should move on. Yeah, this is Dr. Benz's thing, right here. His patient died 15 days later. Now the point of this was that there was no way that his patient received a psychi psychiatric or psychological analysis because what is there in Oregon? 14 day waiting period. So it was simply a second doctor was phoned. That's all that happened here. We move on. Barbara Wagner, I talked about that. We're going to move on. Good. Jeanette Hall. In 2000, Jeanette Hall had uh, been uh, diagnosed with cancer. She wanted to die by assisted suicide. She voted in favor of assisted suicide. She wanted to die. But she had a doctor who didn't believe in assisted suicide. So what did he do? He worked at convincing her to accept treatment. She says, I'm so happy to be alive. It's now 12 years later. If my doctor had believed in assisted suicide, I would be dead. 
Isn't that the reality of it? Because she had a doctor who didn't believe in assisted suicide, because she had a doctor who used every opportunity to convince her to accept some treatment, she went into remission. Now, of course, not everyone goes into remission. The fact of it is, is she would have been dead if she had a different doctor. So they say, it's all about my body, my choice. And I say, well, that's a lie. What it is, is the rules the doctor must follow. Euthanasia is a suicide. When you legalize it, it's the rules the doctor must follow in order to cause your death. That's what it's about. So we may request it, but somebody else is agreeing to do it. And that's the point of the law. We move on. Melfors and Cohen. Important study from 2005, because the euthanasia lobby is always saying, well, if you legalize euthanasia or assisted suicide, then guess what? This problem of homicide suicide goes down. What's homicide suicide? Homicide suicide is when one spouse kills the other spouse and then kills himself. So Melfors and Cohen, this study is, is important because Dr. Cohen is known worldwide as a suicide specialist. She's not in any way ever written about euthanasia or assisted suicide. This is her area. And then she looked at the cases in Florida. And she said, many of these cases were reported in the media as a loving couple where one spouse kills the other spouse for reasons of compassion. Now you've probably heard of cases like this, where one spouse, and they say, oh, isn't it terrible that they had to kill each other? The husband had to kill his wife. Isn't that terrible? The study found that in nearly all the cases, the spouse who does the act usually had a history of abuse and resistance marks were usually found on the victim. So, I think that it was actually something to be concerned about. She did another study more recently that looked at 100 cases, because this one actually dealt with 20 cases in Florida. She looked at another, uh, she put together a study of 100 cases. Now you women should be concerned about this. I read that study through, and it didn't really deal with this question as much. It was just dealing with the, the social factors that lead to homicide, suicide. That study was very interesting. She starts out by pointing out that in all 100 cases, the men, a man killed the woman. And she makes it very clear that there's no bias here. She wasn't looking for that. She was looking for 100 cases. You, when you're looking for studies, you're trying to find 100 cases that you can use effectively in the study. You've got good information, right? So in all 100 cases, it was a man who killed the woman and then killed himself. So uh, I think we have to think of it that way rather than what the suicide lobby or the euthanasia lobby wants us to think. It's all about these people who are loving each other and that's why they killed them. We move on. So I say we have to properly deal with this issue of choice because in many cases we're talking about choice is a lie. It's a lie and it's a misnomer. It's something that's trying to sell to us. The statutes that have legalized assisted suicide are not about choice but rather they are about the rules that the physician must follow to directly and intentionally cause your death. This is what it's about. If we allow it to be the euthanasia lobby to sell us on choice, we will lose this question because everyone in 2014 wants choice. We all want choice. That's how we are. We're, we're pro-autonomy. We all want choice. So, keys to winning the battle. Focus on the likely victims. It's important to work and to have disability people as spokespeople. It's important to work with them because they have life experiences. Uh, it's difficult for me. I'm going through the scientific stuff. But it's better to have someone with a disability who's talking from a personal point of view on these issues. Why? Because their life has a different dimension than my life has in respect to these questions. Focus on elder abuse. Uh, choice is an illusion uh, in this context. Um, when mom is asking for euthanasia and good son is sitting beside her, is she really wanting euthanasia? You don't know, do you? Can you actually prove it? Work with people from all points of view. Be clear about what we're talking about. The other side wants us to be confused. We're talking about being opposed to killing people. That's what we're opposed to. Uh, we're not opposed to medical treatment questions. You know, we're not opposed to proper care. We're not opposed to, we're in favor of palliative care. We're in favor of all those things. We're simply opposed to killing people. That's what we're opposed to. That's what I'm opposed to. Be clear about what it is. The other side wants you to be confused. They're going to compare it to other issues. And we move on. And that's how you get hold of me. Thank you. My name is Martha Crean, and I'm with the DeWeber Institute for Bioethics and Social Research. And together with Tyndale College and Euthanasia Prevention Coalition, this night was possible. But we're so grateful that you came here tonight to listen to what was a very balanced, informative 
thoughtful and disturbing talk, leaving us much to think about and probably much to do with the thoughts that are then leading us to. Um, thank you so much. If you are in any way able to and wish to leave any donation to further the kind of talks and work that you had tonight, we would be um, most appreciative of any support in this way because everything is from donations and people are, are volunteering their time and donations are greatly appreciated. But more than that, we appreciate your being here, your, your caring to listen, to share, and what way this is going to direct some actions that you're going to take from here. We thank you, Alex Schattenberg. We thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. We thank Tyndale College. Thank you very much. There's lots of material here, for, some of it for free and a petition to be signed.